blind.
Watch him one more time. I really wanna cross the line. I do it all before I die. I wanna get it on tonight. I wanna get you one more time. I really wanna cross the line. I wanna get you one more time. One more time. One more time. One more time. Whatever the way you can be. Everybody, that is in the stream now. I am back for another day of practicing Ponables challenges, working on the Nightmare course. And today I will be working on the second of the array indexing challenges. We took four days, I think, to get through this double trouble one. I read through the walkthrough after the end of my stream yesterday. They took basically the same approach that I eventually very slowly arrived at and did a few things that made it simpler to accomplish than what I had uh, been attempting, but largely the same approach. Um, yeah, I guess I'm not going to go through the details of, of how theirs are was a little bit smarter in the choices it made that allowed them to make a uh, get input that worked properly and then do shell code and stuff and they didn't use the helper function at all they just did a straight up direct shell code so yeah um, 
other than, you know, maybe taking more time to look back and see if I can simplify what I'm doing, I don't know that there's a lot that I'm going to, that I can take away from that walkthrough. They didn't have some vastly different method or trick that they used, really. Uh, Triple Dizzle, hello. Welcome to the stream. Uh, so, yeah, gonna... Uh, or I guess welcome to this day's dream. Welcome back. Um, going to move on to the next one. Hopefully it will not be so difficult. Um, I am hoping that I can get this one done just on today's stream. Um, it's named XKCD. It's from the DEF CON qualifiers from 2016. I'm also really hoping it doesn't involve inputting stuff with doubles or floats because that just adds in a layer of annoyance. But not knowing anything about it, I'm going to, I've already copied the file into my practice folder and I'm going to check out the file uh, using the basic analysis tools. Start with file and XKCD is a 64-bit ELF binary statically linked not stripped interesting so with static linking there's not really much that we're going to do with the we couldn't do anything with the got or the plt i don't think those will exist on a statically linked binary um so yeah it's also got debug info which is handy because i think then oh i guess i would still need the source code but that might still give us a like if to be able to see the actual source listing in GDB, I would need the original file. But um, we might still be able to get a little more info out of it running in GDB since it's got debug info on. And then the security settings on it are it's got no rel row, it's got no canary. That's handy. NX is enabled, so we're not going to be putting shell code on the stack and executing it. And then it's got no PIE, so we do have addresses for everything um, because it's statically linked, so everything is included in the binary itself. So, good, okay. Uh, I guess let's go ahead and run it first. And we'll see. Could not open the flag, so we probably need a flag file. which is called flag. Okay, cool. And then I run it and maybe it's waiting for input. Yeah, so it needs some input. We put in a test string and it said that was a malformed request. So let's go ahead and open it up in radar. See what is going on. What's the sort of non malformed request that it wants perhaps. Um, so we'll analyze everything with XKCD, or with uh, Radar, rather. Um, it is a 939 kilobyte binary. Just took a little longer to do the analysis than I was expecting, I guess. Uh, AFL lists a lot of functions, which is to be expected. And it's, it's not obvious, um, unless they are sorting this in a particularly smart way. It's not necessarily obvious that all of these up here are library functions, um, but I'm going to start at the bottom. So we have these functions, which are unnamed, and I feel like uh, all of these down here are likely to be not library functions. I don't think libc or whatever is going to have a free mem3 function and a three mem4 etc so this is probably a good chunk of the functions that uh were written by the application author um okay so let's just start at main it did find main so we can look around here it is going to open up with fopen64. It's probably three. 
Um, okay, maybe that's just like uh, the internal name of libc's 64-bit version of fopen. I guess that makes sense. And first we set the uh, buffering, like basically set no buffering for standard in, standard out. That's always helpful in these challenges. And then we call B0 on we zero out 256 bytes of something at this address is my guess we'll have to see um it looks like we are That's probably the buffer where the flag goes. Because down here we're calling fread from mm, Yeah, so we're storing the file descriptor of or not the file descriptor but the actual pointer to the file uh, C file structure at local 18 and if it wasn't zero so we were able to open that file with f open then we throw that in RCX and we do a call to f read first uh, parameter is the pointer to the buffer that we'll read into uh, Second is the size. Is that the size of each thing? I guess so. Yeah. Um, so one byte elements, single single character, single byte, whatever. And then we'll, we'll read 256 of them. And the last parameter is the stream. So we're going to read up to 256 characters from that file into this fixed address. Um, with the flag so potentially we could find a way to read that flag data I guess um, if we can you know find the vulnerability and maybe that's the way to exploit it rather than like pop a shell um, okay so after we go through with that we get a line from standard in and hmm. wonder if oh, that's a don't have it in my man pages okay um takes a file pointer first param and then a length and returns the pointer doesn't necessarily have a null character the length of the line including the final new line is stored in the memory location to which len points and is guaranteed to be greater than zero okay so you say give me a line from this file here's an address to tell me how long that line is and then return a pointer to the beginning of that line uh, so we are passing rax so we're reading from the standard in file object and then we're reading to this buffer or sorry no this is the address that uh we store the length in at local 30. okay then let's see and rax is going to have the address for uh like local we're going to store in local 20 the actual pointer to that line that we just read 
and we're going to call token on it, str token. Just going to search for the character that we are passing in here um, as ESI. I guess, yeah, technically we pass it as a string for the delimiter. So we are going to get the. Um, pointer to the, what is the return value? To the next token. Okay. So, RAX right now is the beginning of our input string. And then after calling str toke, RAX is going to be the pointer to the part of the string following the first question mark that is in it. If, if there is any question mark, otherwise it's going to be zero. And I think the idea then is, I, we didn't see this output anywhere. So we can check out what's going on in this uh, ifunk whatever. Um, because I'm a little curious, but yeah, let's look in that function. Uh, okay. Can you take me to this one? Um, doesn't want to, uh, wait, what? Um, Okay, that was that's an interesting situation that we have where this is a call and it calls to a function that just jumps to an address, but the address it's jumping to is a relocation. And I would have thought since this is a statically linked binary that we wouldn't have any relocations, but that might be incorrect. Not a dynamic executable. Um, let's see, can we look at the relox? There are some. Okay. Interesting. So it does have a PLT. But if it's not dynamically linked, what is the point of the PLT? Um. And PLT says it's entry, it's empty rather, but all these relocations are in relay PLT. They don't have a name or uh, like, uh, yeah, they don't have a name associated with it. So that's interesting. If I run the same thing on the other binary that we were looking at yesterday, uh, we get symbol names, whereas here we just have addresses. So I don't know where those relocations would come from. Um, they would have to be referenced from a file somewhere, I would think. Unless this is doing some, I don't know. Um, let's dump everything. You do dash A. Okay, so the ABI, we've got all of these functions. And I guess what we could do, I'm gonna still try to just scroll up through this to get to the stuff before, because I don't actually need the symbols right now. Um, program headers, nothing particularly interesting. 
then I mean we have these sections um, the so obviously uh, where is the size on the PLT so, so I, the PLT is not empty neither is the GOT and does it have a dynamic section? Doesn't look like it. I mean, maybe that's somehow related to the debugging stuff, but I wouldn't know. Um, so what I'm gonna look for is like, what is this first address, right? Is that maybe the symbol for one of these other functions that is in or rather the address of one of the functions that's in this uh, list of symbols already in the symbol table. So if we are going to replace this address in the code with this, like this location within the code with this address value so that we jump to it when whatever ifunc thing is called, um, and I guess it's technically calling this one, so I might as well copy that and search for it. Maybe that's a function that's elsewhere in the binary and the uh, the indirection involved is just confusing. Yeah, so that's calling string compare right here. Okay, interesting. So we could So we need to first pass in the string server comma, are you still there? Interesting. I don't know if that's just a compiler weird or linker weird result that comes out of this or if that was an intentional kind of thing to complicate the setup. Um, no? Server, comma, are you still there? Why is that not working? These two strings should be the same. Or is it RAX is going to be the thing that comes after? So maybe you put question mark and then no. I mean, I would, I don't, like you would think the syntax would have the question mark last. So I can run it in GDB. And we can try to see what's going on. Um, let's see. This, did that? There's a lot of stuff in this function. So it's going to be a little harder to see it without the the nice uh, structured graph output from Radar. Um, so we're calling fget line, and then str took, and then we call this address. I think yeah. So this is the address that we want to put our breakpoint on main plus two thirty seven. And then we can run it and we say server comma are you still there? And then we can look at what we have in RAX or rather what we have moved into RDI and what we have in ESI or RDI, uh, oh, sorry, RSI. So RDI is pointer to this string rsi is a pointer to the like statically allocated string so we're good there these look like the same string to me um so let's go past that and now eax is zero okay so if we do take the jump then we go down here Maybe the malformed request is coming from, we need to 
provide a sequence of inputs. Okay. Okay. Um, otherwise, I guess we are getting to this malformed request. Fine. So then it wants us to input a quote and if so reply and then it will look for another quote mm. Is this address they're calling str to gone? Oh, that's the address of the quote character or string, I guess. Um, so we need to pass in. Okay. Let's try Are you still there? Oh, I guess maybe I need space if so reply Hello. No? Okay. Um, probably reading this bit incorrectly. So, disassemble main again, and we know how to get past the first comparison check, which is this one. We are curious about this one, so 304. Do that. Okay, so what we have in RDI is, we need to print that as a string, is a space, maybe the issue is Um, oh, that's my string. Okay. So maybe I'm misunderstanding. What is the thing at this address? That is um what okay it's a quote and a null byte so yes it is just a quote and we are tokenizing For what purpose? Oh, I see. Um, okay, so what we want to send is like something of that nature, 
I think that's closer to what we need. So now we should pass this check. Um, but we don't, even though these look like they're the same string. Maybe that's not the same. It looks like it's calling the same function. Um, see space okay we need to put a space in there it's not displaying the space first but then that's if space so comma space reply r e p l y space and then the end of the string Okay, now we're getting the seg fault. So that is cool. So after we get past it, it's going to tokenize to the next quote and So I think it's just reading the stuff after the second quote, because that's what we get into RAX if it's not null, I guess. Um, and then we try to call strlin on that, and get the length. And then we call mem copy to copy, I guess, that many bytes into this globals object. And we tokenize again on open uh on several different characters, I guess. Um, which is interesting for sure. Um, that might be Radar misunderstanding this string, or those might be literally slash z slash u six four two five um i guess let's look at that in gdb um No, so this is Yeah, just radar is misunderstanding this string pretty hard. So it's just an open quote. And then at seven, we get the close quote. And then at nine, we get percent D letters. Okay. So we're going to tokenize to look for an open paren, rather, not a, not a quote. Um, and I don't, I don't know what is going on with the highlighting. Um, right, that's the percent D letters there. Okay. 
So Yeah, that gets moved into globals for some reason. And then we are going to I don't know if we end up caring about what is in So I don't think we care about what's between the open and close parentheses because we tokenize to the open parentheses and that gets us racks points at the beginning of the part of the string after that open paren. And then we immediately call str2 to get to the close paren and overwrite where we stored racks there. So we no longer have a pointer to the beginning of the string that goes inside of those parens. So I think we are skipping it entirely. And then we are loading an address of a stack variable into RDX to be the third parameter. And then we're going to write into our string, I guess. Or, oh, I see. We need to say some digits, space letters. We're gonna scan that out of our string that follows the open close parens. Okay. And then that number we are going to add, we're going to set that byte in the globals thing to zero. And then we are going to call Sterlan on globals again. And what are we going to do from there? We're moving this to RBX. Uh, okay. So RBX being the number. So if how does that work so rbx is going to be the number of letters that we said and in theory unless we put a null byte into the global string between the quote and the open paren uh then that'll also be the length of the global string um, but we're comparing RBX against RAX, RX being the length of the global string. And if it's below, oh, I was misreading the, where things go. So if RBX is higher, then we must have put a null byte in the globals string. So we're going to go to this error output and they'll say nice try but we can't put a can't put a null byte in there and then we put that info we move the address of globals 
into yeah and then call puts on it so And when we call puts, we just come back up to the beginning of our taking input. So maybe But we're not like, um, do we just need to put a number in here to force, like we can essentially set where we put no bytes? And that's, I guess, enough to exploit this. Um, that's the sort of out of memory range writing that I see. Other than, I mean, we could give a string that is so long um, that we write from global to wherever else um, I don't know where globals is stored at this address okay um, and then maybe the fact that we are calling something through a PLT entry is enough. Um, so we have the, the offsets. Is that 6B73? Is that 6B3? But we could, mm, I don't know that we can just write to it. Um, I think the theory here is that we we could write our code right what is VMM. So we can write from 6b3 to 6b6. We can't execute that stuff. Hmm. Where is Finny at? Finny Ray is 6b3 writable but again what do we what do we write to return to you know um hmm. we could look for system i don't see yeah we don't have a function for system in here. Um, so how can I 
make use of this. I think we can leak arbitrary data by specifying a number in the percent D letters that is larger than the actual amount that we gave and um, of course it's only going to go up through the first null byte in whatever data we're leaking so it probably doesn't get us very far What do we have bubbles at? And then I do have a bunch of stuff after it. And like, can we make use of that for any of these things? This VMM map uh, 6B6. It's the end of the writable, actually. So, where, why is this stuff in 6B7? It would imply that it's on the heap, but. Why would I, mm, okay, I don't know. Maybe that's just where stuff is allocated on the heap, but like, isn't the heap for runtime allocated stuff? Um. Should have an address where we call puts and uh, maybe that's that puts. Okay, we have a different puts for this one. Six B seven three forty. Yeah. Um. So. It's definitely in this section. I just don't get why it is in that section. But that's fine. Or I guess segment is the right, it's a better term. So. What can we do? I don't think we can overwrite anything in the global offset table. because it's at a lower address. And I think the way that we are writing to the globals thing, other than our ability to write a single 
Um, a single null byte to any address we want. And we could, in theory, do that in sequence. Um, beyond that, what we put into globals if we change the well we're gonna have a like random stack layout so I don't think we can modify stuff that's on the stack unless we can find a way to leak it and I mean, this is a very, it's a relatively minimal vulnerability. And so I, you need to be more advanced, I guess, in exploiting it. Um, sort of makes sense for DEF CON qualifiers, CTF challenge, but I'm not feeling like I'm going to come to any nice conclusions about what I can do with it, um, anytime soon. Um, what we could do is just verify that what I think is possible is actually possible. So I need to input a string let's start our exploit code and KCD. Um, say our payload is going to be what is it? Oh, um, server is still there. put hello in it doesn't really matter and then 
You can put anything in here. As long as it is longer than the number we put in here. Pretty sure. Or, wait a second, it was... Do it this way. And let's put in negative one thousand. Okay, this is probably going to be incorrect just right off the bat, but give it a shot. Nice try. Okay, so did something wrong in terms of understanding maybe how it gets parsed. Um, so we can run this one. And GDB. Let's look at what comes out of STR toke, maybe? Before the scanf call. Um, plus 432. Then continue. Send our data. So hit str toke um, step after it. Now rex points at minus 1000 letters. Okay. So then in theory, the scanf is going to put onto the stack at minus 2ch. The value minus 1000. Um, and then we're going to put that into EAX. So um, how do we just print Rex? No. Forget how to do. Like mm. oh, I see. Um, what are the formats that we have? Decimal. Uh, sign decimal. Why? Hmm. Yeah. Why can't we just get it as a signed decimal? Uh, okay. I can do it this way, maybe. No. Well. Um, hmm. 
Yeah, I don't know how to provide the format to print for making sure that this gets printed as a signed decimal value, but C18 should probably be a thousand. Um, how do we do math in there? I don't know, but I can say Okay, I think my off by one is just from the way that the two's complement works. So, okay, so that's negative 1,000. And, oh, but the length of what we... Again, I'm, I misread it. Okay, so now the number that we scanned in has to be less than or equal to the size of the global. So So we just wrote to this address minus 1,000, I think. Um, so if we say six B seven three forty. Or we could probably say object global is minus 1,000. Um, no. Oh, uh, globals. There we go. So if we maybe look at this address. One byte at that address. It's now zero. So we were able to get that right, but then the program quits out. Um, and so RAX is five, RBX is our negative 1000. So not C or Z. Why is the negative 1,000 not considered less than 5? Because it's not small enough. Um, I could have sworn in some earlier challenge. I was determining that the comparison is a signed comparison. So I guess we have set the sign bit, but jump below or equal is different than jump less or equal. Um, let's see, jump less or equal. If ZF is on or SF does not equal OF. 
and I think OF here is, oh, yeah, it's off. So SF does not equal OF, so JLE would actually jump, but JBE up here, jump short of below or equal. So I guess that's the like, unsigned equivalent maybe um okay so we can set stuff we can set a null byte that is i mean now i don't even know I have even less idea of how I can exploit the writing of the null byte somewhere. Because if we if we try to write a null byte to an address that is less than the address of ob.globals, we are going to quit out right after. So unless we are doing it in a way that somehow impacts on sterling or puts or exit or something um and i don't we can't write to the executable segment so we can't just modify how that code executes um so we can't do a negative address and if we write to a positive address that is larger, we can write to a positive address that is larger than the length of, um, is that accurate? So the length of globals is longer than the number of letters that we mentioned. So, and the problem is that number of letters is what we're gonna use. So like we can't actually then write out of Globals, unless I mean we can overflow for through whatever mechanism the length of the globals, uh, whatever buffer is allocated for that, whatever space in memory is allocated for that. Because I don't think it's actually runtime allocated, could be wrong. It is put in the heap segment, but. I don't, I don't even know if we have any calls to malloc in this stuff. It's possible that we have to impact on how malloc works for one of the library functions that might need to do it, but that feels like mm, maybe we can just get the flag though. That's much more obvious. Hey, Julian. I was thinking about this at the beginning. We set up this flag buffer and then, okay, this is probably actually going to be easier. Um, that's the other way around. Uh, okay. Minus. So that is 512 bytes beyond where the globals buffer lives. And so the thing that we need to do is, hmm.
we can call this multiple times. So I think there's this sort of, we need to get that much into globals and figure out where it has the null byte, I guess. So we can write beyond that. Um, hmm. And what do we actually have after our test input? What do we have at the address of globals, which is uh, this one? Have the hello. That's not what I anticipated. But I guess so. Yeah, and then we don't care about the parens stuff. But maybe the parens is useful for something that I am not yet seeing um, hmm. I'm gonna start with I don't think it's that useful so we can put an arbitrary string in between the quotes and we'll get stored there and then, so before we actually run the writing of the zero, which, where did I put my breakpoint? After scanf? I put the... I think I put it on maybe just before the scan of call. That's fine. So let's run it again. Or, oops. Let's run the exploit. And we'll attach to 1697. Okay, so we're at probably this str to call, yeah. Um, so then we can look at what's in globals right now. Where are we? So, okay. And it does have the new line, which is interesting because I maybe I misread how str took works um, Okay, so it is using the same, it's going to null terminate our global string anyways. So 
So. How do we get that then to leak the flag? Because we it's going to mem copy that length, meaning it should copy without. Oh, but we, mm, uh, we put in five, so let's do like 10 bytes. Uh, so it's just all null bytes to begin with anyways. So if we do 512. Okay, so... Do 513, and that's flag, right? 120. F L A G, open curly, T E S. Yeah. Um. Okay. So, if we write 512 bytes, then mem copy is going to right all the way to there and then we can say five like 600 and 12 and since that number oh I see and that's why we loop so we sort of guess at the length of the flag and Oh, but if we guess wrong, then I don't know why we loop. Um, so let's say, let's create a random flag, because I think some of this logic depends on us not knowing the length of the flag. So what if we, um, Random mark? Why did you put on random? Randint. Random dot randint. It's very old. Um, well, maybe that's still okay. So with open flag. Just start it with that, and then for do this. Oh, it um. do that for now oh it's also it's up to 256 right so we could actually do um, let's do 245 then dot right the character from Um, hmm. Let's do 
six one and it's twenty six in the hex. Eighteen plus two is twenty uh a one a seven b Let's cap the flag, just double check that that code worked. Uh, I am getting letters that are not what I want. Okay, so it is, it's inclusive, I guess, the randint. So I need to do 7a. And I, my math is just wrong. Um, Indentation, okay. Uh, did I write that wrong now? Okay. Go check that worked. What? Did we get a really bad? Oh, I missed the for loop. Oh, geez. Okay. That's a very painful way to go about this, but let's see. Um, there we go. All right, that looks fine. So. We've got a random length of flag that should be long enough to fit into, that should be short enough to fit into the buffer of 256 bytes. And, but we don't know how long it is. So if we do, Yeah, where does like so we took us to the end of the quote? I would have thought this is the string that goes into quotes, but apparently I don't know how stuff works. Um, so that's fine. Um, oh, that's why. Okay. So we, no, that doesn't matter. Um, just do it as five twelve plus. Okay, got the wrong length or something. Um, try it here, and we'll do GDB here. 
I okay. That's it. Seventeen sixty one. Then we want to put that same, maybe, maybe not the same breakpoint. Um, so I don't necessarily care about all the tokenizing stuff. We can put it on the call to scan F though. Four sixty four. Continue. Send the input. So, what do we have in globals? Print out that string. Okay. So we do have a string that includes the flag. Then What we're getting is racks is that and okay. So I think we just need to loop this then. Um, Say uh, two hundred. We definitely shouldn't need that many. Rather than generate a bunch of strings in Python and say payload start is that we'll just call send and target.send and actually a times 512 or oh you know what that's fine um, we'll do that for payload we'll still do send and we'll just do this part separately the results if nice try not in res then print res and break otherwise tries plus equals one
Oh, we stopped with. Okay, let's do the. Let's just do one. Looks fine. Okay. I guess I need to set the log level. we can see oh that's one approach you know what I'm going to just continue on this one and um, let's say if flag in res then we'll print and sure, we'll just print it twice if it happened to work. We are getting a nice try. Okay. So in theory, we are sending a shorter amount each time. And that should eventually get us the result that we were looking for, but it also might be that I am sending the wrong because I switched stuff around here, it's possible that I'm sending the wrong uh, structure. I don't know, uh, like structure of the payload itself. So let's run it as debug. And then our breakpoint we want on scanf, I guess, simplest, 464, we'll continue, send our input, and then so we got 300 into racks, and the comparison is is 300 less than 291 both hex no so we fail we'll continue and then 2300 oh, that's not what i wanted to do 2303 
time. So now we're at two FE. Okay. So yeah, that seems fine. Um, let's see, then I'm going to continue on that and I'm going to update the script. Um, Um, I think Python has ternary. Let's see. Um, nope. Does not okay. Greater than two. Here is we'll say if debug and debug on so we can put this stuff down here. Debug on is true or debug on equal to tries, then we'll pause. Versus, it's going to do it five times. Okay. Then what we want is um, uh, 111. Let's do 110. Six seventy one. So now two ninety two is not less than two ninety one. Okay. Uh, so we'll do it this way instead. Um, So this should be taken. So now we are going to print out that stuff and jump back. Uh, we need to just put another Um, so then we'll do that, and we might need to do target dot send line. Do it without debug. Let's see if that works. Uh, really, we want or less than or equal to. Would 
that should work. No, we got an EOF in send line. So let's receive the line. Um, Otherwise, we do. Can we just say like target dot kill? Because on one of these, it should put. What pause? Twenty seven. Um, just gonna, but oh, you know what I want to do then. Do it that way. We're still in pause, but I'm not doing debug. So why are we hitting the pause? Debug and debug on is true or okay. There we go. So that one was, you know, it seemed really difficult at first because I thought that the exploit was about using the ability to write a single null byte from this, but then as I dug into it more. I realized even if I can s provide a value for racks, an arbitrary number to offset from this fixed globals location and print that um, to like, and then set a null bytes anywhere in the binary. If I do it anywhere prior to this address, we'll come down to the false case and the program will quit. So our impact from there is very limited. It doesn't really, it's very unlikely that we would have been able to do anything with that. And so then looking at where can we write a null byte after globals, again, to satisfy the check, it really does have to be within the length of the input that we provided or the length that that input seems to be because if we write just enough to hit to the beginning of where the flag gets stored because we're using mem copy it's not going to put a zero in there that's what this code is for it's supposed to put the zero between here but if we give a length that's long enough that it goes after the flag at the same time it has to be exactly after the end of the flag so that's why we did the loop we had to repeatedly attempt different locations to place the zero could we put it here no that's too long could put it here no that's still too long and then eventually we get to putting it right here and that's exactly the length of our combined junk string to fill up the globals buffer and the length of the flag which we didn't know so you just loop enough times until it works and then it'll print out that whole string for you which includes the flag at the end so i'm going to read through the walkthrough but i think that was what was intended and this one, yeah, turned out to be a lot more straightforward than the double trouble one, at least as, as far as my experience with it. Um, let's see. The challenge also gives us a link to this XKCD comic. So let's see. That's probably where the text that you have to send comes in from. And maybe it's one of those sort of like the very classic XKCD comic about Bobby Tables. Um, just 
somebody saying one character saying to another character uh something that involves like some code so it would be a buffer overflow kind of thing maybe heartbleed interesting oh because we uh We sort of, I don't remember how Heartbleed works, um, but maybe this will explain it. <laughs> That's what it, the name of it is. So, so there's potato. Oh, there's bird. Ah, so uh, yeah, then I guess the Heartbleed TLS issue was like you could ask it for a certain amount of data that was more than what you were actually giving, uh, requesting that it send you back. Obviously, this is a huge simplification over the actual bug, but effectively, it's this concept. So, um, and yeah, I mean, probably if I saw the comic, it would have helped a little bit in getting to the answer quickly but like more quickly but i don't know this is a pretty straightforward one all things considered snake pliskin asks i like the name or i guess it's snake piskin um but i'm guessing it's a reference to escape from la new york that series um uh how would you even begin to learn this so it sort of depends on where you are at in terms of what you know about computers currently. Um, the stuff that I'm working on right now, these like Ponables challenges, and I'll go ahead and throw a link to this series in this course into chat if you want to take a look at it. But certainly it's like, as I was describing it to somebody on the last stream, this is more like a whole bunch of the end of chapter exercises that you might find in a textbook teaching uh in this case this topic but like if it's a math textbook right this is like going through and just having tons and tons of math exercises to do so it's not necessarily the right way to learn it but i'll throw it in there in case you want to keep it in your resources if you get into this stuff and want to work on it um if so where to begin really does depend on where you are right now i'd say if you don't have a lot of reverse engineering experience, and I guess I shouldn't say a lot, but if you don't have reverse engineering experience of any sort, and you haven't done um, anything with assembly code, that might be a place to start. If you haven't done anything with C code, okay, so this kind of thing, um, so with zero experience, I'll say the stuff that I'm working on right now is very about low level details. Okay, so you do web dev stuff, so you've done some programming work. That's good. You already have some context from that. Um, certainly what would be an easier way to get into the mindset of um, security in general, but more specifically like offensive stuff is uh probably the try hack me website uh there's definitely a bunch of other people on twitch that stream doing try hack me challenges so if if you haven't seen those i would check those out i think optional ctf uh does that stuff like almost every day and there's there's a sequence a set of other people for sure that do it these are more web focused uh challenges in large part and i i'm recommending it as a way to start just because you already have the context around web development stuff you know how a web application works you know how a web server works in terms of http requests that kind of thing and so you can start to get this sense of like oh if i wrote the code this way that opens that represents a vulnerability that if somebody sends a very specialized request what i didn't intend the client to actually send uh then they can sneak past whatever protections I had tried to put in. And once you're in that mindset of thinking about, okay, here's how the system is intended to work, but here's how we can look at it to find out if somebody does a very particular thing, they can get it to 
of like work in a different way than we intended as the developer. So what I would say is you're already in a really good position having done some web dev um, or maybe a lot of web dev, I don't know. But like as much as um, there's a push in infosec to not be very gatekeeping about like oh you need to know how to code and stuff to be able to do infosec and i largely agree with that the more you understand about coding stuff the more successful and uh the the better that will like that's just going to help you be better at doing offensive security vulnerability research kind of stuff because you need to be in the mindset of the person that created a thing and then be able to think beyond just what they were thinking when they created it. But if you don't even understand why somebody would create a web app in a particular way, why the code would be structured a certain way or something, it's going to be really hard to envision how you can subvert that, I guess, or it's going to be harder to envision it that way. So lean in a little bit on on your existing development work um and then try to add this additional way of thinking about it which is really like a very intense way of thinking about what bugs could be in your code uh you say so like binary trees linked list stuff like that um some of that could be in there um it's sort of I mean, that's like data structures, algorithms kind of stuff. And there are potentially vulnerabilities that could come from that. I think a lot of times the vulnerabilities that you're seeing in a web application probably aren't on, on that level of stuff. It's more um, we are like parsing of parameters in something. So um, a very classic kind of bug is like if you this doesn't happen anymore with like ruby on rails apps but it was the case early on in ruby on rails that maybe you have a request where you can say like user id is equal to whatever right and that gets put into a structure in the code into like a, a dictionary i don't know what languages you're most familiar with it would be like an associative array in PHP or a dictionary in Python or a hash in Ruby. Uh, so it gets put into one of those structures with a key value kind of thing. And if you just put on additional parameters like admin equals one or something, and that happens to be the name of a key and the correct value for it that gets used by the code, even though the person that wrote it didn't intend you to be able to add that in, the code as they wrote it doesn't pull doesn't like basically you didn't have a whitelist to say only the user id parameter is allowed and so you can stuff more parameters in there and get access to things or control over stuff that you yeah writing a property on an object that would be probably the javascript terminology so if you maybe are doing like a node.js express.js kind of web server back end if you just pull all of those parameters and put them in an object and then pass it to a function that doesn't know whether it's supposed to use the admin property or not, like it doesn't know, hey, this came from a request where we should ignore the admin property if they did put it in there because they're not allowed to force that value in. So that's the kind of thing, um, exactly, you rewrite the default, right? And then you can control the behavior of the application in a way that was not intended and so really where you get to um is is being able to think about these uh pieces of code yeah you renamed it to what you probably as the person trying to hack the system you just sort of guessed hey maybe there's a property name this or in a lot of these web applications, the framework is open source, so you can go read through the source code and see, oh, it, it has a property named this, and it has that, and it has such and such impact if I put that property in there. Um, so then you can sort of subvert what was intended by the person that created the application. But it really, it's a, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you can call it lazy coding or bad habits, but basically they're bugs, right? And things that 
I would call it a bad habit or especially lazy if the person that was writing it had the recognition that this could go wrong and just didn't decide to fix that vulner that like uh this turns out to be a vulnerability but in general like if you're coding something and you think oh it would be a bug if this condition happened and then you don't go ahead and write your code to prevent that bug or at least write a test to verify that that actually is a potential bug um then you're being a bit lazy but if it's if it hasn't even occurred to you that that could happen that's really more about not having the experience and the knowledge to understand how to analyze your own code for in this case security vulnerabilities which are just a subset of bugs in general when you're thinking about it from the developer standpoint and then cross-site scripting is a big source of that so i think if you do try hack me you can get experience finding and exploiting those sorts of vulnerabilities that are more in the vein of probably what you're already experienced with. And then once you have that mindset about, okay, there's code and then there's a subset of bugs that can be exploited so that an attacker can basically control the behavior of that code or otherwise leak information that they shouldn't have access to. Those are the two biggest categories of like exploit. Um, maybe, you know, there's a vulnerabilities that let you get like admin privileges. I guess that's a third different kind of category but you, once you have that sort of mindset then you can start to learn maybe do some assembly language coding maybe learn c i would say learn c before learning assembly code because a lot of stuff that you'll learn in being able to write c code to do stuff then translates really well to assembly but is easier to learn in the context of learning about c and then once you know some more assembly code then you can start looking at these more low-level binary challenges where the principles are the same, the code has been written in a certain way, but there's a bug that can be exploited. It's just that the details of what those bugs are and the mechanisms for exploiting them are in a different category than a web kind of situation. And so the knowledge that you're leaning on to be able to understand those exploits, or sorry, understand those vulnerabilities and create exploits for them it's just a whole different set of skills that you're going to have to learn if you don't have any assembly C low level kind of knowledge. Um, so that's what I would suggest is like sort of build on where you're at right now. And then if you think the level low level stuff looks cool, start going in that direction as well. There's definitely stuff on try hack me where they have some uh, like buffer overflow exploits, things of that nature and that's a perfectly good way to get started uh because they they're, they're very like instructional oriented there's only a couple of them that i'm aware of i think but um you can at least get a feel for like oh was that fun did i enjoy doing that stuff maybe i should continue pushing in that direction and and see if i can learn more about this low level stuff i think for some people that side of thing turns out to be not very fun and they want to do primarily the web stuff, but it's all in the same mindset of this like offensive security. How can I find the vulnerabilities and then weaponize them as it were, exploit them uh, to achieve my own goals? Um, which pairs well on the other side with defense of like, how can we then prevent you from taking advantage of the vulner of the vulnerabilities that do exist and figure out how to fix the vulnerabilities so that they no longer exist uh but yeah the web stuff i mean especially if you're looking for a career in infosec and you want to maybe do pen testing stuff try hack me is a great way to get started and the web application uh pen testing work is probably uh is a much larger field than probably the low level stuff just because there's a lot more websites out there most companies are have their exposure to the open internet through websites more than like a random server binary basically um and if you you know that maybe they'll run a uh i don't know an exchange server or something that is 
talking to the internet that's not on a VPN. But things like Exchange and the other big like software that you might just run directly on the open internet but is still like a binary program, uh, those will have been analyzed quite a bit. So it's even harder than than usual to find new vulnerabilities in there. It's not impossible, certainly, but it's, it, it takes a lot of experience, it seems like. Like, I don't think I would be able to do that right now. How long have you been doing pen testing? I've actually never worked as a pen tester. Um, so, yeah. Uh, the stuff I'm doing right now is because I find this stuff really fun, and I would like to get into vulnerability research and sort of finding and reporting zero-day bugs that are in these low level, like binary exploit categories. Um, the sorts of like, oh, there's a bug in the JavaScript for Firefox, the JavaScript engine. So if you go to a malicious website, then it can take control over your computer. Yeah, certain bug bounty categories. So in particular, like uh, the zero day initiative, zero day initiative, not the, um, If you, yeah, this is a new, or not a new, but it's another kind of bug bounty program. G generally speaking, it's like a bug crowd or a hacker one or uh, whatever the other big one is. Um, but it's more, they don't take like most web vulnerabilities. They are more focused on the like binary applications and stuff so like here's a bunch that just came out um literally yesterday in adobe reader i guess oh no premiere um character animator i don't know but like they have a lot from adobe a lot of stuff from microsoft especially for either the kernel in windows or hyper v um i guess free bsd kernel and yeah, so these are the sorts of programs that they are usually accepting or I say offering money. I guess they're offering the bounty money on, on programs created by these uh, companies and not necessarily like um, a, a bug in a web framework or certainly not like, hey, somebody has deployed a website and they've configured it poorly, which is totally a the kind of bug bounty that you can get in something like hacker one. So if there's like uh, mcdonalds.com and they have some backend website for their management system or something, and you can get access to it because it's part of the bug bounty program and you find, Hey, they put a generic like password one, two, three is one of the ways to get into the system. Like that's absolutely a bug bounty that you can get a little bit of money for. That's probably on the low end of money just cause it's a, uh, a really easy fix they just shouldn't set a really bad password but you know that's not a broad category of like that doesn't mean the wendy's website also has that bug right so these are these are like the bug is in the software itself and anybody that deploys hyper v or vmware or something would have this issue and that's why they they end up paying a lot for these bugs um potentially tens of thousands of dollars for a lot of these so this is what I would like to get to eventually. Um, but I mean, I'm going to have to practice a lot and then I'm going to have to start practicing on real world things. And then I'm going to have to start like pulling out all these advisors and seeing if I can go through them and follow along with what they're doing. And then I'm going to have to get really good at fuzzing because that's how you actually find the vulnerabilities in these binary programs versus I guess it's like the equivalent of the enumeration stuff that happens on pen testing where you need to find what all the domains are and what all the pages on those domains are. Uh, because if you can't find the pages, then you don't have anything to look at to see if it's vulnerable. So enumeration and fuzzing these like searching for what could be vulnerable is a super critical part of the actual real world bug bounty vulnerability research or assessment task and it's i'm sure it comes up in if you're doing pen testing work on a which is just the same thing but as a private contract and you get paid even if you don't find any thing although it would be weird if you didn't find anything uh is my understanding of pen tests like they 
they usually aren't run by companies that are so perfect at security that nobody can find any problems. Um, yeah, so that's what I would suggest. Uh, and if you're looking at stuff for Try Hack Me, there's just a lot of content. Um, they let you stream working on any of their programs or any of their uh, rooms, as they call them. And maybe Vulnversity is like the way to start because then you can learn about the different kinds of web uh, vulnerabilities. And I would also check out uh, a whole category of people on, I think you can probably, um, if we go to Twitch and search for uh, Try Hack Me. Yeah. Oh no, that's the account, Try Hack Me. But they, they're on, but um, there's a category. My browser will load it. It doesn't want to load it. Um, but you can definitely, hmm, I don't know. The people that I would suggest looking up are like uh, optional CTF. He does tons of that stuff. And there's various other folks. Um, I think maybe the Cyber Mentor does some stuff. The Mayor 11, I think. Uh, does a bunch of boxes on there so those are a couple that I can recommend right now and then you know maybe search uh, from there on outwards Ash Fox is great and he does some stuff on try hack me and, and a bunch of other he did you know a wide variety of stuff for sure um, yeah hope that has been helpful and uh, I think I'm going to finish up the readme on this one or the going through the walkthrough on this one. And then we will take on the next array indexing challenge tomorrow. I streamed for what turned out to be like seven hours yesterday. So I'm going to let this one be a kind of a short stream to make up for it. Um, let's see. Let's take a look at the challenge, right? It's the heart bleed explanation. Oh, thanks for the follow, Snake Piskin. Um, so it it probably has some relevance to that exploit. Also, as a bit of a spoiler, this challenge is going to seem more like a reversing challenge than a pwn one. I guess that's fair. There wasn't like a lot of... I mean, it's just a data leak once you understand how the code is written. So, yeah. I don't I also don't understand necessarily why this counts as array indexing. It is more like a buffer overflow in that they they have a fixed buffer size and I don't know, maybe it's not technically overflowing that buffer. Yeah. I guess it's it sort of barely feels like an array indexing challenge, but Let's see. You can see that we clear out a space at this address to put in the flag, stored in the flag variable. And because of this and the check it does to ensure it's successful, we will need to create a file titled flag that resides in the same directory as the binary in order to run it. However, this block of code is essentially just scanning in the contents of the flag file. Yeah. Next, we can see that it scans in our input with f get line. Proceeding that, it will split up our input with strtoke function using the question mark character as the delimiter. It'll compare those results. So we got to present this as the string. In order to pass this check, we would need to start off our input with that. Yes. The next block is pretty similar to the last one. It's parsing the same string. You can tell since start strtoke has a zero as the second parameter, um, I think or if it's uh, as the first parameter, rather. Um, okay. And... We don't need our input to be a specific string. Oh, maybe this is talking about the next chunk. Okay. This one, yeah, we need to say, if so, reply open quote and then it 
doesn't need to be any specific stuff between the quotes. Sure. And it calls str to initial input twice more. Okay. I need to go through the details of how it's trying to parse the input. Uh, let's see. So then it scans in to get the the number that we provided for number of letters. Passes the address of globals to puts to print it out. Our input is copied to globals in a in a previous block. Yeah. Um, it will null terminate a value at some offset we specify, which if it is in between the start of our input and the start of the flag, we won't get the flag. In addition to that, it does a check where if the index we give it is past the length of the string that starts at globals, it returns. So this is the key. We need to give it a number here where that number needs to be after the flag because if we put it before the flag, then we aren't going to print out the whole flag because that'll be the end of the string. So when we call puts on it, it'll just print up to that null byte. But we also need to not put it after the, like immediately after the end of this of the flag. We can't put it 10 bytes after the end of the flag or 100 bytes after the end of the flag and just print out a bunch of garbage afterwards. We need to put it exactly at the end of the flag Otherwise, this check uh, will fail and we'll go into the nice try and exit negative one. So that's what they're, that's the key that we needed to figure out. Now, the offset between the start of our input and the flag is OX200, 512 bytes. So we see we need to have a string uh, of length 200 hex copied over to globals in order to leak the flag. To pass the index check, we can just set it to be the very end of the string. Of course, when we run it remotely, we don't know where the end is, but we can just guess and check. Let me, I'm reading too fast and not thinking about what I'm reading. To pass the index check, we can just set it to be the very end of the string. Of course, when we run it remotely, we don't know where the end is, but we can just guess and check. Uh, yes. So that's what I did with the loop. We didn't know the length of the string for the flag because I generated a random one because I knew this was going to be part of the, the mechanism and I didn't want to give myself a too easy of a challenge by already knowing what the flag was. So we generated a flag of a random length and that allows us to then set up the loop which does the guessing and checking repeatedly until we find the right length. That way we pass all of the checks. Assuming we guessed right, it's not much, it's not much like a five to 10 byte increments. Um, yeah, I guess you could do a binary search. I was doing sort of a linear search from the end of the possible range. So the way that the code works, it's, it uh, allocates or has specified 100 bytes, sorry, uh, 256 bytes of memory to put the flag into. So maximum the flag is 255 bytes with the null terminator after that. Um, yeah, I think there's going to be a null terminator on the flag, but maybe not. Maybe it could be up to 256 bytes. In any event, uh, we don't know how long it is. So what I did was start at 256 and go backwards one character at a time. So then I did 255, 254, 253, etc. cetera. That's kind of a slow process. Um, we could have done started, we could have done a binary search. So then we could bring in our like a little bit of algorithmic knowledge and say, let's start at 256. If that is too short, or too long rather, which it almost certainly is, then we'll go to 128. If that's too short, because we printed out only part of the flag, then we can go to halfway between 128 and 256, <clears throat> which is uh, 192. But if 128 is too long still, then we can go to halfway between zero and 128, which is 64, and then maybe that's too short, so we go to halfway between 64 and 128, 
which is going to be what uh 96 and then halfway between 96 and 128 or whatever it is uh to find that way you end up finding the length a lot faster of course then you got to write a binary search which i'm always like i get off by one issues with that fairly often so it didn't seem like it was worth uh doing all of that work especially on a local challenge where I can just run 256 iterations very quickly if I needed to. And I think what they were doing was like uh, starting from zero and going up in five to 10 byte increments, which is also perfectly fine. Uh, or maybe they were starting from like 50 and going down. Because the flag is probably not going to be closer to 256 bytes, it's probably going to be closer to 20 bytes or something. Um, but you never know, especially on a challenge like this, why wouldn't you generate a really long flag? Uh, cause that the length of the flag is the key part of this challenge. And then, uh, yeah, so they, if they pass all the checks then they leak the flag, this is based off of the heartbleed exploit since heartbleed exploit was based off of leaking memory from a server by requesting more data from a server with a specified length that was larger than the length of the data. Yes. That's basically what the XKCD comic showed. And that's exactly what we did here. Right. We gave it some data. It put that in the spot. And then we told it the length of that data was a lot longer than it really was. Putting it all together, here is a script that will leak it locally when the flag is flag got on boys. Sure. But that's just like a fixed, I don't know. This is not the script that you would use to solve the challenge in the actual CTF. I think the script that I ended up with is a bit closer. Um, having the loop to try it several times and figure out automatically would be my ideal, but you could do it manually, uh, figure out that length, and then uh, you get the flag through that mechanism. So, okay. Uh, didn't miss anything on that challenge that one ended up being a lot simpler and yeah uh feeling good about getting that done and hopefully we'll be able to get the next one done on the next stream if i end up going a little longer on the next stream maybe we could do two of them we'll see thank you to everybody that has joined in chat um and or is just watching uh the live stream I can put my info up here. Um, my website is hamled.dev, H-A-M-L-E-D dot D-E-V. And that'll take you to my GitHub page right now because I have not gotten around to creating the usual blog site where I can post about whatever I'm working on. But if you want to contact me, uh, my email address is there on the GitHub page. So if you have a challenge that you'd like me to work on, especially like a binary exploit kind of challenge, feel free to reach out to me over email and send it over. And I'll try to take a look at it on stream. And uh, you can also contact me on Twitter at Hamled Online, H-A-M-L-E-D Online. And uh, just send me a tweet or whatever. Uh, follow me if you want. Sometimes I retweet stuff about programming. Sometimes I retweet stuff about politics, U.S. politics in particular. Uh, JL97 says, what you normally do, binary exploitation. That is uh, what I have been doing on a... So right now I'm trying to do every day some more binary exploitation to get through this whole course. I think, uh, depending on if there's actually people watching on a regular basis, I might start putting in other stuff that's maybe a little more entertaining to watch for an audience. Maybe I'll do some try hack me rooms or something. And I do want to start working on my own sort of tools and, and writing code that'll help me understand things a little bit better. So writing code for, uh, what is the right term? Um, not disassembling, but uh, and not decompiling, certainly. Um, 
decoding decoding like x86 instructions because uh despite all of my attempts i still don't quite have a good intuitive sense of the binary representation of the machine code for x86 instructions and writing some code that goes from the machine code instruction to the assembly instructions will probably help me get a better sense of that just I'll have to write all of the logic into my code so I'll better understand it. Um, PE or ELF, uh, all the stuff that's in this challenge or on in this course are ELF binaries because they're all Linux, which I think is just very common for CTFs. Um, there's just a, a strong emphasis on like using Linux uh, or, I mean, you could use Unix as well, but these are Linux compiled binaries. Um, uh, what am I saying? So a lot of CTFs, you'll just have elf binaries as the, the thing to work with. Maybe a CTF that's very heavily focused on reversing will then have stuff that's PE, um, and you know, windows binaries. So if you go to like a uh, flare on, which is a series of CTFs, um, that are entirely about reverse engineering they we see some of the previous they uh, let's see okay information uh, you just have a zip file so there's not even really like a good site with like uh, write it or um, I don't know preview text about each of the challenges it's just a zip file with a ton of binary files in there and you're supposed to reverse engineer them to find a flag and so some of them will be PE files some of them might be ELF files some of them might be like DOS or um, Commodore 64 or uh, a weird image format, not even an executable program. They go the full gamut of whatever they can come up with to be like weird and unusual um, file formats and, and uh, executables. And that's sort of the, the fun of this reversing challenge because the, it's put on by FireEye who do a lot of malware analysis. I think the malware analysis team is the Flare team in at FireEye. Um, and yeah, uh, so they're always, you know, their day-to-day -day job is like looking at weird binaries that malware uses to do its whatever mal malicious stuff. And so they figured it, the challenges that they want in their CTF are reflective of that kind of stuff. So that's where you might see a PE binary, but like a DEF CON qualifier CTF, probably not going to have any PE binaries in it just because then everybody playing it would have to like have a windows machine or set up a windows VM in order to get in there and put their tools on windows. It just adds more complication uh, and the default assumption is everybody's re using Linux for whatever reason. Probably, you know, have Kali if you don't have your own Linux set up, I guess. Um, that being said, I have reversed stuff that is PE, not for exploitation purposes, but like playing video games and wanting to do like uh, hacking on those games or something. Um, that's where I have uh, done most of my PE based reversing work but i don't think i've done any actual windows like vulnerability exploitation um i would like to get to that point it seems a little more advanced the windows kernel stuff and, and all of that is uh more complicated it seems like than linux um generally interested only in elf and linux so then you're you should you know be in a good spot to do CTF stuff and, and all the stuff in that nightmare course that I linked um, and the stuff and thus the stuff that I'll be doing on stream is going to be all in that category. Yeah. Uh, Snake asks, are you running a VM box? Um, so I'm running Linux as my host OS and then the 
challenges that I'm working on for the Nightmare course are running in an Ubuntu VM that I have set up because that was just sort of what they recommended in the introduction. Uh, I think, I don't remember, it seemed like the thing to do when I got started on this. So they're all sitting in there, but realistically I could probably run them on my host. And yeah, this is Radar uh, over here. Um, I'm using it because these binaries are relatively simple. I think I'm not as skilled with it uh, as I am with uh, Binary Ninja, which is the program that I use when I'm doing more involved reversing work for like large binaries rather than a CTF challenge where almost all of the code that you will find is related to the challenge. If you are working on a, you know, some general purpose program, you've got just oodles and oodles of code that aren't necessarily going to be relevant to whatever exploit you're trying to develop or whatever vulnerability you have found. And so having a more, having a tool that you're more familiar with, let's say, because I don't want to say, I don't want to badmouth Radar and say it can't do stuff for that. I don't know. I'm just not as capable with it to know how to use it on that level. Um, but for these relatively simple challenges, Radar works and it runs in the terminal, which is the situation that I'm in because I have this VM that I'm just SSHing into. Uh, what was the challenge this time? It was this uh, DEF CON qualifiers 2016 XKCD challenge where uh, you they, are, they sort of implemented the Heartbleed um, TLS vulnerability, but as a, uh, static buffer in the binary. So you provide some data to write into a buffer and then you provide a length for that data. And it basically puts a null terminator at that length and then read and then prints out your buffer. And so if you give a length that is longer than the actual amount of input that you gave, you can leak data that whatever data immediately follows the end of your buffer for the input that you gave. And as it happens, that location immediately following your input space is the flag. So it was, it ended up being relatively straightforward. Um, you just write enough data to fill up that buffer and then give it a number that is larger than that buffer by exactly the length of the flag. And it will then print out your buffer and the flag. And the trick is you don't know what the length of the flag is, so you got to repeatedly guess uh, at numbers until you find what the actual length of the flag is, and then it'll print it out for you. And I wrote a little script to do that guessing repeatedly, and that that worked for me. Okay, uh, I can see. I don't. Okay, OBS died, so probably got a disconnection on the stream. Um, I'm going to end it here anyways. Uh, did I study computer science in school? No, i uh done like a couple of community uh, college courses, but never did go to university. So I'm, I'm just one of those guys that's like, I was working on programming stuff in like middle school and, and then onwards on my own. Uh, and I just found it really early and it's always been a super interesting thing to me. Uh, so I've continued to practice it, I guess is a good way to put it. Um, yeah, didn't end up getting any kind of university degree. Um, but that's sort of, you know, if, you, if that's the route you're going, if you are or have gone again, like all of those skills can be very useful on the security pen testing vulnerability research side of things. Cause it's, it's the other half of what you are looking at is like, why was this, why does this program exist as it does? If I'm reversing a program, it goes so much faster. If I can imagine what the code is intending to do and my ability to imagine what the code is intending to do really hinges on whatever understanding I have of, of how I would have written it. If I had to write a program to do this, 
what is the code that I might have written to do it? Um, because hopefully they've done something relatively similar. And then if I have that kind of idea in mind as I read through the code, either stuff lines up with that or it doesn't. And that goes a lot faster than just looking at a bunch of assembly and trying to piece out instruction by instruction exactly what's happening. Which is, that's sort of what the problem goes resolves down to if I really don't know what the thing is supposed to be doing. So I think if I was like um, confronted with an encryption algorithm or or something like very math heavy and I didn't understand how that worked because I, I really don't understand how like the details of encrypting some data with AES work or generating a cryptographic hash with SHA-1 or something like I don't know how those algorithms work. If I saw the assembly code for it, it would not be a very smooth or painless process to arrive at an understanding of what that assembly code did. Um, so the more you understand on the coding side of things, on the creating code and creating programs side of things, the easier it will go when you are looking to reverse engineer stuff for the purposes of uh, binary exploitation or sort of reverse engineer what you imagine the web application is doing for the purposes of a web pen testing project. Um, they are very complementary skills, which is why I try to recommend that folks look at both sides of those things. I, anybody that does development work, I would recommend look at the like breaking of stuff for security purposes because the more you understand about that, the more you can develop code which doesn't have those bugs in the first place because you will have done the thinking on it as you wrote the code and fixed the bug before it ever got released to the world. Um, and then conversely, if you are doing the security research, understanding how the de code development works will help you find the bugs better and faster. And so they really should be looked at as skills that pair together very well. Like you wouldn't learn uh, a sport um, without, you know, maybe it's a, like a team versus team sport, like in the U S football and soccer else, you know, everywhere or uh, football, I've already put myself in a weird situation terminology wise, but like American football, Canadian football, Australian football, rugby, whatever, right? Like you have an offense and a defense part of your team and you wouldn't only learn one of those things uh, when you play the sport because you need both of those things and they pair together, right? So the same thing kind of happens here. Um, so, yep, that's it for the stream. I think I've been rambling enough. Uh, thanks for the follow, Jay. And uh, I'll be back tomorrow.